All right. I'm going to be starting the 13th uh, public call for the WARF project. Um, we are today going to be diving into the updates that have happened since last week. Um, go over a few things uh, that are coming up. Um, and then just kind of open up and see where the conversation goes. So should be exciting times. Uh, I guess a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to be canceling next week's meeting. I'm going to be unavailable on this time next week. Um, but the following week, we'll pick right back up again, see where we head uh, after that. So just kind of as a preemptive heads up. Generally, I don't know that I'll be unavailable this early, but this time I do. So um, diving into some updates, uh, that's one of them, this article, but we will hold off on that just for a little bit. Uh, we talked about last week where we left the Anchor plugin. Was It was kind of in an unfinished, or there were still some bugs in it, and we hadn't released it yet. It was released, uh, I think, the day after. So last Thursday, we finally put out a release of it that is fully functional. Uh, there was another update just within the past 24 hours uh, where we fixed a couple more bugs, uh, things with like triggering requests manually and um, being able to cancel some of the requests properly. Uh, so the Anchor plugin itself is in a pretty good state now. Uh, I don't think we've updated the UI test for that yet, but any application that pulls in the plugin should have a functional yet unstyled version. Um, bringing us kind of one step closer to having a really solid environment for apps to be able to integrate with all the wallets. So um, there have been a number of other updates to repositories. We don't have to dive into them specifically. Maybe just, uh, sure. I'll just touch on that. Uh, so the wallet uh, wallet plugin anchor, I kind of just like, looked at it for a few minutes. It's um, the way you kind of wrote the readme, it seems that like for the different uh, wallet providers, They'll just write another plugin under the same kind of template templating style. But I want to ask where where would one set uh, a different um, protocol handler? For example, like we talked about previously, is that part of the wallet plugin anchor? I would imagine it. It is not at this very moment. We're actually going to be making some updates um, to the EOS IO signing request library. Uh, we talked about that on our dev call last night. The I don't I think we're using it in here. Um, have that, but um, to this library, which is a dependency of Wharf and of the Anchor plugin, um, it only really supports ESR right now. Um, as the prefix for the protocol handler. And we need to make some updates to this library so that way we can support ESR-Anchor and ESR-Bombat, for example. Um, so that way each wallet can have their own specific one. That is coming. I don't think that this plugin specifically is going to be for those other wallets. We would anticipate we're going to kind of extract some of the logic out of this plugin and make it into more of a generic package. And then there would be a wallet plugin Wombat, and there would be a wallet plugin Haifa. Um, and each of them would define their own URI, URI handler for. So, so in essence, like uh, ESR being a requirement of the wallet plugin anchor, that say wallet plugin anchor we use as a template to build our own integration for a different wallet. But then when specifying or importing that uh, signing uh, ESR, like the, the signing request, basically, they would be able to provide context of like any the type of handler we want to use, or we're still going to be limited in terms of like hard-coded uh, handlers to choose from? It will be anything. Um, there, we're, we're, what we talked about last night was removing the validation so that way any prefix on the custom URI could be used. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the, the, this library right now actually has a check in it that if you try to use anything besides ESR or web plus ESR, it'll say it's an invalid format. And so that leads people to do like string replacement before they pass it into this library. And we really just shouldn't have that at this point. We should just open it up. 
Also, you're saying Web Plus is already in the current form already integrated into this, the Web Plus ESR? I believe so. If I can find it. We had links in our chat yesterday, but uh, if I search for Web Plus, yeah, you can see it right there. Um, pretty much see, if, yeah. if we don't get ESR or Web Plus ESR, it's going to throw an error. And like this just needs to go. So, and then we're going to make it so that you can customize that at the uh, SDK level. Perfect. So, and then each plugin, uh, each wallet plugin will be able to specify what that is. It's not at the state where that's abstracted enough to be able to do it. Uh, we're going to first have to update the signing request library, then update all the dependencies, and then the plugin will be able to implement that sort of change and make that decision. And then to agree on a, like the global uh, protocol handler that will be um, attached to the you know generic connect wallet button that will reference whatever your OS has as a default handler for the protocol, while the different wallets can have their own additional handler, like we said, to yeah. only invoke that wallet from a site. Yeah, uh, we dove into this a little bit in our call last night as well. And I think what we landed on was we're not going to have a default handler to start with in the Wharf UI. Like you'll you'll have to manually pick which wallet you want to use. Um, but then once we get enough wallets participating where they all support ESR and they all support their own specific prefix, then we can um, revisit that and then come up with a default handler when we actually have uh, enough integrated support for that sort of thing. Yeah, I was just thinking the advantage of having the existing ESR as a default handler <clears throat> would, uh, at least in the short term, would allow this current plugin to work with, well, I guess you would just use a new wallet plugin anchor. But I meant like, um, yeah, I, I actually, yeah, I don't see really any advantage of having to do it from now, fair enough. Yeah, and these are all really good long-term goals to try to standardize all of the wallets that use ESR um, and come up with a naming scheme. Like we should all, like all wallets should register as a default for ESR, and then they should all register their unique handler. Um, so that way we can build user interfaces like that. Um, but like right now it would create just not the best user experience until we're all upgraded and implemented with the specific ones as well. So maybe by the time the uh, Wharf and all of its uh, com child project components, whatever we want to call them, um, once those all hit like a release state, we might already be at that point where wallets have this support and we can make that change. But like right now, like our we don't even have support for uh, some of those handlers in like our Android or desktop version. So some changes that we have to standardize and go through as a community. Sounds great. And hopefully, um, like right now, you can see this is kind of two levels deep. We have the wallet plugin template, which is what people who want to make wallet plugins should be extending um, as opposed to forking an existing wallet plugin. And we want to create one level in between these two as well. So there probably will be like an abstract wallet plugin for ESR that um, Anchor would extend and then Wombat and any other wallet using ESR could extend to get some of the logic that's baked in here. Like these buoy types should be global if you're using our message relay format. Um, these ESR helpers in this file, these should be global. Like here's a helper to extract the signatures from the callback that was received. Um, these We shouldn't have to replicate these in every single plugin that follows the same protocol. So there will be some level of abstraction happening in between these two plugins, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. We just got this working uh, fully like yesterday. So we haven't started ripping out and abstracting things yet. And also maybe just uh, another question. Um, is currently like callback.anchor.link or cb.anchor.link 
what does that actually do? Is it just to communicate, say, if you want to sign on your mobile and have that uh, kind of external server handle the communication? Or is it also used if you're on the desktop and you're, you know, like uh, launching Anchor itself, does that automatically communicate directly with the website? Or does it still have to go through the callback uh, Anchor link uh, server? The buoy is what we've been calling this service. That's what runs on cb.anchor.link, which a lot of wallets just use. Um, we have like a distributed worker system that runs this software. Um, it's a helper, essentially. Like ESR can operate without it. But what this does is that it makes it so the only custom URI that needs to be triggered is the initial login, the identity request that happens. Um, and in that identity request, it specifies uh, a channel in which future messages can flow. And this makes it so that like, I, if you're in a browser that constantly makes you click like three times every time you custom open a custom URI, you don't have to deal with that like degraded user experience because now the messages can flow through an encrypted channel using buoy um so that's kind of the whole point of it is just ux um and it's not required but it certainly helps with <laughs> the user experience yeah but at the cost of you know like kind of like a central uh server like as long as it's like an optional thing for added user experience and you're still able to communicate between uh, just the wallet itself and the DAP without relying on this external server that could be, you know, DDoSed or for any oh, reason. It doesn't necessarily have to be a centralized server, correct? Correct. And yeah, you can it... provide your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that you can provide your own in the in the options, but at the end of the day, your your data is relaying through uh, an outside server. Then the DAP you know, uh, front end and the wallet itself. I understand the reasons why it's there. I'm just wondering if it's like required or it's like it's not just required. a nice to have. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's to get also around stuff like this. <laughs> it's also turtles all the way down, right? Because whatever you're calling for a mobile device is going to hit Apple or Android's centralized services. So. For uh, sure, you, you know, you, you like, uh, like in the mobile world, you're you're much more strict, restricted. But generally, just taking crypto and wallets, uh, some people prefer not to have you know like another dependency uh, that could go wrong in the future. Say for whatever reason, like they will always be dependent on somebody running that server. Correct, and that's like on this specific screen. This we have this on all of our SDKs as well. It's like sign with another device or trigger manually. This link right here is the ESR payload. Like in the background right now, it is communicating using these web sockets to send the transaction so you don't have to trigger it. But the fallback option is always available. And this will be a button that is more clearly labeled in this process. Um, but the fallback exists there in the event that for whatever reason it's not available whether that's malicious or neglect or whatever it may be. Yeah, oh, that's perfect. And you can see there, I it, it has all the callback handling. So like I, I'm canceling an anchor and it's sending the response back to tell the user that they canceled it. Um, but it, as we were just talking about that, I kind of showed that the anchor flow itself is now functional. It's again, not styled, but you can scan or you can trigger. Again, these will be buttons and these will be styled to make it better. Um, but <laughs> Firefox really likes to open a new tab whenever you use a uh, custom link, apparently. Um, it's again, one of the reasons that we have this is just that Desktop deep linking or uh, custom URIs is is bad. It's and there's nothing really as an alternative to trigger the opening of an external application with data. So a lot of these are kind of workarounds just to make sure that we can provide a good user experience in all environments and then fall back to these URIs when uh, the good experience doesn't work. So. 
next door steps. And we do like kind of, I guess, walking backwards in the conversation. Um, we'll have that abstract wallet plug in so that way other people can extend and do this as opposed to just forking this. And then we all diverge on different paths of the code, making different improvements, having that like shared common ground. So that way in the end, the plugin itself is uh, just like this would just be anchor logic and not um, ESR logic, essentially, that we would all share. So there's really not a ton to it anyways, but we will uh, hopefully get something out in the not too distant future with that. Cool. Any other ESR anchor related thoughts, comments, suggestions? For me, that covers it. This is great. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, no problem. Um, we might be showing up the console renderer in the near future. Daniel, this has kind of been his pet project. Um, it's pretty neat. It's a interactive. Uh, it's a way, it's illustrating that you can use all of this on the command line and create Clios like pooling that could even work with Anchor or it could work with anything. Um, anything that WarfKit would work with. It follows all the same patterns. It effectively is a user interface just in the console. Um, and yeah, I don't, we probably won't push this incredibly far, uh, at least in terms of priority. Um, like I said, Daniel's excited about it and he's kind of passionately working on it in the background. So you'll probably see some progress continue on it. Um, but who knows if this will actually become a fully usable product. It is, it is at best right now, I would say, uh, a playground and a use case test for us. So. A work of love, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there have been a couple of those. So uh, this is where my passion, uh, fun project has been recently, is this autocorrect plugin. There have been some changes to it. I worked on it over the weekend. Um, the big change there, I guess, that's notable is that the autocorrect plugin, let's say you have an account that has no CPU, no net, and no RAM. And you perform a transaction, which is going to use CPU and net, and the transaction also consumes RAM. What the previous iteration would do last week is that um, it would prompt you for every single error it would encounter. So you might end up with three, four, five, six acceptance prompts before it corrected the transaction suitably enough for it to be completed. Now it does all of that in the background. There's like a, it's a recursive function call that's happening with like a loading animation. Um, and it will fix all of the problems and then present you with one prompt at the end with a sum of the entire cost that now it will take to correct the transaction. Um, so I remember using the one in Anchor where it auto, you know, like uh, you pay a fee and it covers your CPU and net. Mm -hmm. I assume you're using the compute transaction endpoint for that. Yep. But uh, what I realized is it didn't take account, didn't take credit into account. So at the end of the day, you accept the fee. Obviously, you don't get charged the fee because this, the fee is added as an, you know, part of the atomic transaction. But the whole transaction fails because you don't have enough RAM. So yeah. I assume this like takes care of that too. Yeah, that actually, we had a bug for a while. Um, when you're using that right now in any live environment, that's all uh, fuel happening in the background. Um, so it's a centralized API that we operate that evaluates transactions and changes them. Um, there was a bug for, uh, I don't know how long, to be honest, but it was preventing the RAM purchases from being included in those transactions. Um, that's since been fixed. So the live version, if you did encounter that same situation again, it would include RAM and it would include that in the fee. Like, and then the buy RAM bytes action would be embedded directly in. So that should work on live versions of the Anchor SDKs now. Um, and th that is what this resource provider plugin does. It actually hooks directly into Fuel or any other API that's running the same pattern. Um, so you can create custom ones. And this is kind of the centralized option for that. 
and let's say you were running, I think Pomelo is a good example of this. Um, Pomelo has a resource provider running and they cover the transaction costs for their users. They're, I believe, following the resource provider standard and running almost identically to fuel, except their business logic has changed. So now they are only covering probably token transfers to Pomelo or something. And if you tried to do anything else against the resource provider, it would fail it out because Pomelo doesn't want to cover those types of transactions. Um, with what they have set up, I am pretty sure that once Pomelo flips to using Wharf, they can drop this plugin in and it will plug in to their centralized uh, resource provider and be able to cover the transactions that they want to cover. That does use the compute transaction on the back end to help correct those sorts of things. The compute transaction is running on the back end to evaluate the transaction. The This plugin, the autocorrect, is actually doing all of this in the client. It is decentralized. Um, it is not quite as good of an experience because all of this needs to be done in the client. Um, but it does not depend on a third party uh, hosting a resource provider endpoint like Fuel or like Pomelo's or any of those. This uses the compute transaction endpoint directly to determine um, what's wrong with the transaction and then automatically correct it. So, and for that to be accurate, you're going to want to have uh, the machine doing the compute transaction mm -hmm. in line, almost specs wise, with the producer. Because there's no point having, you know, like OC on it or a very under, you know, powered machine. Mm -hmm. It's just going to give you bad data uh, in terms of what you actually need in resources, right? Yeah. In terms of CPU, absolutely. Um, if you hit an API node that has OC enabled and is really fast, like the autocorrect plugin might be like, oh, this transaction's fine. And then when you submit it, the API is going to accept it. And then when it gets shoved upstream, if you are borderline without resources, it might get dropped because of that differential in processing power. Um, exactly, and vice versa. Like if you're, yep. you know, if if it's like underpowered, it's gonna like give you too many false positives where you need to add a fee when in reality you don't, you know. Yeah, and so the to kind of address that and the way that this one's designed, there's a floor of um, how much CPU because what we're really talking about right now is CPU. Uh, this doesn't. Net's not a problem because it's objectively built and RAM is the same way. Yeah. So it's all CPU. Um, one of the ways this tries to help address it is by setting a floor. So if the compute transaction response returns and is like, oh, you need 100 microseconds or millisecond, 100 microseconds to complete this transaction, the floor is going to push that up to like one millisecond or something. It's going to increase what uh, you're going to be powering up in this case um, before it Maybe actually tries to do it. a bit just to yeah. try to not have a field transaction, which makes a lot of sense. Yep. And to make it so that um, you know, if they do another transaction right afterwards, maybe that one's going to succeed now. It's like we're it's going to automatically create a buffer on the user's account that buys more resources than they may actually need. But arguably, that's going to improve that user's experience because they're not going to get prompted every transaction. Yeah, basically over provisioning the resources yep. uh, required to to account for discrepancies with the server, the BP at the time of that block, as well as just future transactions. Yep. And not to mention, I believe PowerUp has a minimum purchasable amount. So if you tried to buy like 50 microseconds, I don't think you could. I think you'd be forced to get more than that. So yeah. this, there's some stuff like that, and it's configurable. So like, if y an application developer is like, oh, I don't really like this default behavior for my users, they can go in and change that default behavior. Or maybe they want to increase it. Maybe they're like, every time somebody doesn't have enough, let's buy 5 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds of CPU for them. So that way, we don't have to keep nagging them. Um, yeah, which is the more likely to change someone may be willing to do if, if they actually wanted to change it. Yep, exactly. So, so yeah, I guess kind of walking that one back, um, we have two options for resource providers at the moment. And we're hopeful that like maybe somebody has a brilliant idea and comes up with a third or a fourth or a fifth option on how best to handle this kind of stuff. 
Um, but the functionality is there, and the autocorrect plugin now, um, the user experience this week is much better than last week because I, as one of my test accounts, I had like, I had this loop happening where it wanted me to approve the prompt to accept the fee like five or six times. It was, uh, I needed CPU, and then I said, okay, let's power up CPU. And then it's like, oh, to power up CPU, you need to buy RAM. And I was like, okay, I'll buy RAM. And then it came back and it was like, oh, now you don't have enough CPU again. And it just kind of entered into this loop until it corrected itself. Um, there are some, I think, API changes we could make to the compute transaction endpoint, which I have notes on, but need to open a GitHub issue for, um, to potentially make it so that this plugin could operate better and we could solve resources issues even better. Um, the kind of- yes, currently you're saying because you you were reiterating it, meaning that like you you know you'd send a transaction, you'll get you realize as an issue in CPU, for example, then you will bundle in a power up for CPU, and then you'll get another issue that says RAM. Like that's yep. a typical okay. Exactly. It's because the transaction changed and um, the actual power up action now takes RAM that the original action did not. So. Part of this is because when you get an error back from the compute transaction uh, endpoint, it only returns the first error that it encounters. Uh, that endpoint can potentially be changed to act like an accumulator of errors, and it will just it'll go through every check and then figure out every error that transaction may have encountered and then return them all. That would optimize. But yeah, but instead of relying on just the error it gave you, because it also gives you the, the how much CPU, net, and RAM got consumed. Um, so you could tell ahead of time, for example, if like just by getting you told you CPU error, but you see that it's going to actually use net that is more than what the user has, you would already know about that, for example. What you won't know about is when you add the power up, how that will yeah. affect the transaction. Yeah. Exactly. So if we, there's going to be some ways to cut down on the amount of API traffic this needs. Um, and it'll. Power up could be profiled in a way to figure out really what it uses, power mm -hmm. up itself, and that could save you a few costs. Because computation, you know, endpoint is, is going to be rarely exposed publicly. And if so, it's going to be rate limited, right? I would hope it's not rarely exposed. Um, I think that the argument is that if you expose compute transaction, it will reduce the amount of times push transaction is required. So there's, um, there's a justification for actually making it enabled. It, it's going to catch and pull off traffic from the actual push endpoint. Uh, due to people retrying things. Um, and if we can make yeah, the compute enough. transaction more lightweight, then that even provides more justification. So, but yeah, I imagine they'll be rate limited or something like that. And hopefully people don't bump into that with this. That's an ideal world, but I'm sure yeah. you know that the biggest offenders are people just running scripts as fast as possible, you know, trying to mine something worth one cent and just bombarding the API. So they're not going to try to compute and figure out that, you know, like these yeah. same offenders, they're, they're just going to stick to their, you know, just hammer method. And yep. they're not interested in trying to save the API, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And those people aren't going to use the compute endpoint. Like they just, they're going to keep hammering the push endpoints and uh, we'll have to just keep throttling that. So yeah, it makes sense. I guess I, did. I don't really see a use case for people hammering the compute endpoint. Um, although it might be nice, it could in the future be nicer for them to be hammering that than they are the push endpoint. But it sounds like uh, it's going well, to be a discussion. They're going to do that, right? Because uh, they just adapt, right? If, if your compute transaction is not being throttled, but your main one is, then they're going to just be like, oh, great, we'll just keep computing. And once it passes, we'll push. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, I believe at the end of the day, everything needs to be rate limited or throttled uh, 
or at least you know some type of like adaptive firewall that will like ban them for a bit or something yeah agreed and if we can get to the point where the compute endpoint is actually more effective than push because it's it's designed to only be temporary in nature uh maybe there's a way to optimize it so that we could actually handle more traffic on that as opposed to push and it lightens the load on the push endpoints that's again an yeah. ideal future but might be interesting to see how that interplay between client and server uh can evolve as we move forward and i wonder if the oc itself could be kind of quantified where you could enable oc on your compute transaction yet the values it returns takes into account that it's OC compared to not, but I think that's going to be much more difficult to, to you know, quantify. Yeah. Because uh, it will differ based on the hardware, uh, the percentage increase I'd imagine. Yeah. And if we go this route with the ecosystem where this becomes the norm now and people are actually computing transactions before they can perform them, um, that's probably going to open up more discussions about whether we need to move to a more objective CPU billing like we do with Net and RAM, um, how we optimize these call patterns, um, and uh, just a whole new set of conditions that we really haven't seen in the past. Yeah, there's going to be a whole new architecture layout for that. Like, I'm imagining that the node operators are going to want to set up some kind of compute nodes which are only meant for computation not yeah. meant for sending transactions to yeah and that, I mean, that in theory could be parallelized i would imagine exactly awesome. and if we can pull that traffic off of other sources like as an operator i would love that like compute away people like <laughs> i'm fine with that if you're exactly. not interacting with like actual push because push is when we actually care about like that succeeding. Absolutely. Do you guys use send transaction too? Like, or do you support it in your APIs currently? Because that's kind of the most efficient, like, uh, like in IBC stuff, we always have to track finality and things of the sort. And if I'm not using send transaction too, which I think only Nation was providing at some point and their APIs are not generally very fast uh, from a client perspective. So like I end up, you know, having to use a combination of like get blocked uh, on a sequence and making sure yeah. the transaction is still there. But I think send transaction too, if people start adopting that, that would be a great efficiency improvement. Yeah. I know we, we don't explicitly block it. So, I mean, on our end, it should be enabled as well. Um, uh none of wharf uses it yet we're using send transaction right now uh, i don't remember exactly why we made that decision right now um i think it might have been because it was just going to be difficult to configure it uh at the base layer but that's certainly a switch that maybe the sdks themselves here can make at some point um, the other option. I think is, the main disadvantage is you don't get any call back or like return until you've reached whatever it is you're trying to reach, whether it's in block or you know whatever blocks deep mm -hmm. uh, it is. So you're not getting. It's not like in you know Web three or Ethereum where you're you know you get back. Okay, here's a transaction, and then there's a, a continuous callback where you're like, oh, okay, on confirmation one, on confirmation two, where you can track the whole life cycle. Through like, mm -hmm. like a socket connection, then here where you submitting send transaction to as a HTTP endpoint, and you're waiting until whatever options you set with it, right? Like, uh, oh, send me back uh, only once it's in in block, right? Yep. So maybe then you don't have transaction ID, but that you can calculate yourself. But like it's a, it's a bit like uh, there's a trade off in a way. Yeah. And the other option there is to um, use the get transaction status API endpoint after you've submitted it with either push or send transaction, um, because then you can pull that endpoint over time and just you know show the confirmations, quote unquote, of where that transaction's at as it reaches in an irreversible state. Yeah. And we run that it's on all of our API. To figure out, 
But you know, in EOS now, like if I push a transaction and say the, um, the API node that pushed to returns to me that, okay, got pushed to block number C1000 for simplicity. But I keep tracking it because I need to know the actual block where it's in. And sometimes I see it's actually went to 10 blocks down because, you know, like mm -hmm. if the block gets full or the, it pushes it to the next one. And kind of I want to track that in real time. And I find without doing many like stupid calls, like get block every few seconds and checking the transaction. And then based if it's there or not, look at the next block. And if there's another error, you know, like handle all these different kind of stuff. It's there's no real easy way to to track that like there is in, you know, Ethereum, for example. Yeah, we're actually going to be we talked about this last night. We're going to be creating a plugin to track finality like that. Um, it'll be it'll use the the get transaction status API endpoint uh, and at the end of the transaction flow, like this one is an example of a plugin that uses the after broadcast hook. Um, it'll be another plugin, probably transact plugin finality or something um, that at the end after it's broadcast, a UI will pop up that, uh, every couple seconds calls get transaction status with the transaction ID and it will re it'll let you um, visually confirm or reach that point where you know that the transaction is confirmed with only that one API endpoint provided it's available um, and you won't need to like scan around in different blocks or whatever it'll just it'll use that new API endpoint to um, show you when it finally yeah makes it into a block and reaches your desired um confidence in its uh yeah, yeah. so maybe okay. you set it so you're like uh, if it's in 10 blocks which would be what five seconds uh then we're good enough but maybe you want it to reach your reversibility whatever it may be um hopefully that api endpoint will be able to provide that information that then informs the plugin and can inform the user of like here's here's how finalized it is and then once we get faster or instant finality you know that might only be a couple second wait I could, can't wait <laughs> yeah that'll be really nice so the plugin might seem a little absurd when it first comes out if you have to sit there for two and a half minutes or whatever it is <laughs> but then when instant finality comes into play and it's like some just lower second amount then it'll probably get a lot more usage. Cool. We have dived into some good topics. Um, as far as other plugin updates, I don't know that I have a ton. Uh, the Cloud Wallet did get updated to fix some issues. We have a new discussion board. Um, it's discussions on the organization itself. I don't think anybody's used it yet, but we are going to try to facilitate this for long form discussion. Um, things just get so easily lost in Telegram that if we could have some place where there's knowledge being collected, then it'll be really easy to reference other people into that knowledge. Um, we could use the EOS community forums or we could use some other forum based platform, but since people are going to be in GitHub, why not just try to try this out? If it doesn't work, uh, we're not married to it. We can always move to some other platform. Um, but felt like a good opportunity to give it a try. So we dove into this in the blog post, which came out on Monday. Um, this is our second technical preview where it dives into how to use the session kit itself to integrate into a web application this time. That first technical preview was about how you build a Node.js application using the session kit without a user interface. It was all about manually creating a session and performing transactions with it. And this one is all about the user interface and how you can have the user interface generate sessions for you. Um, it uses a boilerplate. There's a full example that's took maybe like 15 minutes to build, um, goes through all of the steps for somebody that might not be familiar with any of this. We've tried to pepper links to the discussion board throughout it, so maybe we'll catch people and get them in there. Uh, it includes the three base packages that are kind of required, well, not required, 
um, the two base packages that are required, and then you can use any wallet plugin, but you need at least one because otherwise the session kit has no idea how to create a session for you. Um, goes over setting up each line of code, what it does, some caveats that are still in existence. Uh, we discovered while working on the Open Block Explorer that our uh, DOM content loaded event didn't fire. So like in the Open Block Explorer, we manually had to call the append dialog element method to put the wharf interface into the HTML. And that was because uh, their view application, I think it's Quasar, um, wasn't actually injecting spell or injecting Worf's SDKs until after that event had fired. So that's something we need to resolve. But for now, there's always a manual option. Um, we just put a brief note about that. Setting up the wallet plugins, setting up a very simple session kit, and then diving into how you use the login method, what it'll return, um, how to use it to perform a transaction. Um, trying to just skim over this briefly. Logging out users, whether you want to log out a individual session or you want to log out all users, because natively, the session kit is a multi-user environment. It's both multi-user and multi-blockchain. So that way, applications like Unicove, um, you know, you can go there and you click login, and you can log in with a WAX account. You can log in with 10 WAX accounts. You can log in with an EOS and a WAX account. You can log in with any network that it supports all through this same functionality. Um, and this is, if you want to log everybody out, you can just call it without a parameter. Um, persistence, the thing you need to call to load the default session, which is the last used session within the application. Uh, and then just in general, some of the files and trying to, again, pull people into some discussions. So. We've seen a couple people start playing with it now. Uh, I know it's probably not the top of people's priorities lists. So this is probably um, more of a fun project for a lot of people right now. But we're hoping that like somebody's going to try it out with React and somebody's going to try it out with, I don't know, some other crazy web framework. And we'll be able to collect all that feedback and see how it works um, from other people's perspectives and what problems they may run into. So this is out. It's gotten a couple hundred views, I think, at this point. I haven't looked since yesterday. Um, but we're looking to push comms on this and start getting people engaged so that way they can try out what this is in this very early version. Um, the user interface itself, like in all the demos you've seen, is not complete. And last week, we kind of dove into what that user interface will be. That'll be in the next version. We kind of touched on that here, where we're going to include the graphical user overhaul in the next version um, and add some of the missing features that aren't quite there in the 0.3 release. So things are, are yeah. Uh, just another uh, question. Uh, that looks great, by the way. Uh, are there any plans to support Ledger or other hardware wallets directly from uh, Wharf versus having the wallet itself supported? I know it's a bit of a loaded question because <laughs> you know, you're know you going to have to communicate through, like for example, the, if you're communicating from a front end, you're very limited in the options you can use to communicate with a ledger that are always you know having issues with the browser. And like I don't need to tell you, I'm sure you're aware, yeah. uh, compared to, for example, using it on a desktop application. That is, you know, can talk to USB devices or, you know, use their other uh, like HID or whatever methods they have support for that are more stable and not related to a, to a browser per se. Because I remember USGS uh, had like USGS ledger or something, uh, just mm -hmm. uh, ledger signing something. And, um, but that one never really, it was very limited. It supported only index zero. Remember, I did a PR for it, like to support other indexes and integrated it with UAL at the time, but it's just never got any love. And I know now that like Ledger is, you know, we're doing some work as in like the, the EOS or ENF is doing some work to, to keep Ledger kind of integration alive uh, by, you know, updating the app and all that fun stuff uh, on the Ledger side. I was wondering if there is a path to bring back direct Ledger support 
from a front end uh, versus having to rely on front end communicating to a wallet that communicates to the ledger. There is a path. Um, it is not part of the project scope currently. Um, so like it's it's not in any of our milestones and we don't have a plan to do it right now, but it, I imagine it's possible. It is debatable on whether it should be encouraged because there are some security concerns with that. Um, namely in that when you are using a web application to perform transactions and it goes directly to a ledger, you have to trust the web application is doing what it tells you to do. This is the same problem with web auth as well. You have to trust that the website you're on, that web application is not lying to you about the transaction it's about to perform. Um, it could be telling you that it's going to send 10 EOS to the exchange, and in reality, it's emptying out your entire balance into some phishing account. Um, that's so that, easy. Like part of the, the transfer is easy to overcome because obviously you're going to see it on your ledger, right? That it's like you're same, not, the same. No, you will see it's transferring this much EOS that you have to confirm, unless it's a more you know non-standard transaction, which definitely they can. You know, if you're if you're just approving hex data, yeah, of course, you know, like uh, that's you can you can get screwed there, as well as on top of it, there's a security kind of flaw, I guess, where if you just have your ledger connected uh, to the browser, I can just have the UI scan all your different indexes and harvest all your public mm -hmm. keys to be able to to track you if if I have malintent, right? Yeah, or to link your accounts together. So I see the downsides, but it's just. I don't know. I was hoping for a future where you can use your ledger directly. Yeah. But maybe that's just me. I I personally want that too. It's it's the hurdle of the device though. And you're right. If they're doing system token contract transfers, it will display on the device. The device itself will render out any known actions from the EOSIO or the EOSIO.token accounts. But the minute you're not using either of those contracts, you need to approve the hex data. And like Tether, maybe Tether is the good example of that. If you were doing a t uh, transfer of USDT, it's going to be hex data and you're not actually gonna be able to confirm that information on the device because the device can't interpret ABI data. Everything is just hard coded for the EOS and EOS IO token contracts. And that's the I why I can tether, understand those. I might be off, but I think I tried on Tether and it does work. It does show it. I think any ESIO token variant was working. But anyway, that, that, that still yeah. doesn't remove your point that like, you know, most blockchain actions outside transfers are just going to be hex data. And unless you're, you know, decoding them and have the ABIs in your head, is, is, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a big security issue. But and uh, just to kind of put a button on that though the a plugin can absolutely be developed that creates this connectivity it's like i said originally it's not in our project plan currently i imagine it would take uh maybe a month worth of development to complete so i i think it's possible there should be no barriers in the way um i know we just kind of got lost on the concerns of potentially doing it not whether it was actually possible it is possible as far as i'm aware I was yeah, going to say, if anybody has uh, stuff that they want me to test for, put into the builds for Ledger, for that US app, let me know. Awesome. Yeah, I was if wondering you, if Ledger could be, you know, like ask, like I think that will also handle the security issue of harvesting all the keys. If it almost asks you, like, you know, before it uh, accesses it, accesses the key, on the ledger if you know basically there's a request to access this key kind of thing versus you just do a request you know like to, to the ledger once you're connected and you can get literally every key out of every index no limits no 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 even throttling or well it takes about like a half a second to a second but there's nothing stopping like the user if they have the ledger connected to a website or just connected and unlocked they don't know if the website is trying to do something with the ledger. 
Yeah. So I was I was going to say if um if there's features that you want, it's best just to file issues so that we can flesh out the discussion because I don't I don't completely understand the scenario you ran through. Fair um, enough. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and to then formal, I'll, formalize it better and put it to an issue. Yeah, I wouldn't. You don't even have to formalize it. Just you know, throw something in there. And we can get started on it. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you know, you know, Aaron, you're right about the ABI stuff. It's so hard to read those transactions. I mean, because Ledger is none of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know how bloated it. I don't even have a model for how bloated it would be if we put that stuff in. Uh, you could, there's a there's a maximum uh, megabyte limit for each each ledger application, so you'd only be able to fit maybe one more ABI in there because the system ABI is still massive. Oh, really? Are they that big? Oh, yeah, the system ABI is pretty big. I mean, because all we have to do is de deserialize it. We don't necessarily have to know what it is. Yeah, if we could but actually pass. For... If you pass an Sorry, ABI, you're still you're still uh, susceptible to a bad actor or a bad DAP because, like, the DAP is going to send the ABI, right? Yeah. And they can send any ABI versus is. in the yeah. case of like Anchor or a wallet, the wallet is going to make its own call to you know like like an endpoint to get the ABI. So it's also like you you still you, you may even be more tricked because it will get the ABI, it will you know put like different fields and different things uh, and you might just be tricked even easier than than hex data which most people would avoid to sign if i recall correctly there's also a limit on uh transit data through the usb yeah there's a couple hurdles in the way to but it would be great if it could actually do that sort of stuff it just it seems impassable at the moment to actually make it so that the ledger can decode every action on the network. Well, I, I mean, I can look into the, they have a new device stack, so I can look into the new device that has different limits, different capabilities. Um, but uh, yeah, it would, be, it, would be, it would be a bunch of work, but I mean, at yeah. least we can know what would be possible, what wasn't. At that point though, you'd be doing so much, it's almost like the ledger would take over as your wallet. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the goal, right? Where it would it, even some some account linking included in that. Yeah, and maybe I, this isn't possible because of uh, not technical strength constraints, but more business constraints. Um, maybe in the future, Ledger Live can actually be one of those sources of truth, since most Ledger users are going to have that. Um, it could act as anchor in this situation, as the trusted source that says, this is what you're about to do, um, as opposed to the website. Because really, the, the solution we have right now is that you need to trust one thing, and it's better to trust your standalone wallet, like anchor or whatever it may be, to show you that transaction, rather than having to trust every website you use independently. So it's like we need that bottleneck, and it can't be the device right now. It has to be something in between whatever you're trying to use and the hardware wallet. In the future, hopefully, that's not always true. But we need that, to. That would be a good discussion topic. Yeah. <laughs> Where do wallets begin and end? Yeah. Or I don't even know if that's the right way to phrase it, but. Yeah, yeah, sorry for sidetracking, but just a thought. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these big picture topics that we'll have to dive into as time progresses. Um, that definitely being one like big wish list item. Um, there's a number of others, I'm sure, but it's how we come together and figure that out. So, okay, we... I got to run to my next yep. meeting. I'm going to drop. Bye bye. Great. Thank you much. Uh, we can probably wrap things up as well. Um, if you guys have anything else you want to talk about, I'm open to it. But otherwise, mostly it was today was mostly a progress update, letting you know next week we're not going to have one of these, and then talking a little bit about this uh, technical preview that came out, and hopefully being able to encourage developers to give it a try. I mean, it shouldn't 
it's not a massive undertaking to implement into a boilerplate or into a web application. Um, and that sort of feedback is going to be incredibly valuable moving forward. Yeah, no, it's, so, yeah. it's basically just follow the steps. It doesn't get easier, assuming you're, yeah. you know, basic development, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I guess uh, anything else we want to cover today? Otherwise, we can wrap this call up. I say we wrap it up. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys uh, for joining in, and we will do this again in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Always a pleasure.